silence your cell phone uh, for the duration of the service. We are a welcoming congregation united on the side of love and justice. We like to say we don't have to think alike to love alike. We strive to walk through this life with open hearts, open minds, and hope all those who walk this earth with us will find the strength and will walk it with best intent as often as possible. May the time we spend together today in this place Make us braver, more compassionate, and wiser than when we woke up this morning. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism, you might take note of our mission statement, which is printed on the front of the order of service. We also work together to promote and practice the eight principles, which are printed on the back of the order of service. It's our uh, we're glad that everybody's here. If you're interested in learning more about us or you would like to research our newsletter or want to find out how you can be more involved in this community, there's a white card in the back of the pews for you to fill out and either place in the collection plate or leave on the table in the foyer so that we may get in touch with you. We will not hound you, we will not intimidate you, or even call you if you don't want us to, but if you want to know more about us, you can, you can find the, the information there. If there's not a white card in the back of the pew, there should be one on the table in the foyer. For further information, you may also speak with one of our membership committee members who have orange name tags. I see a couple of them out there. Um, uh, the folks with, and they should be able to answer any questions you may have. And of course, our website, uusv.org, has more of an information as well. Missing a page here. Yeah. Oh, it's our tradition to welcome first and second time visitors, or those of you who haven't been here for a while, to stand if you're comfortable, and doing so, and introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from. So we'll start on the right side of the room. If there's anybody here for the first time and want to introduce yourself. Hi, Julie? I'm Julie King, and I moved here in 2014. I came for a dog sitting job. And I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Anybody else on this side of the room? Okay. Anybody over here new or here for the first time, second time? Hi. Um, I'm Hannah Weber. I'm actually a member at the Presbyterian Church, but I'm curious about the message today, so that's why I'm here. It's a topic I'm interested in. And I've lived in town for seven years. Oh, yes, sir. My name is George Brosey, and since April, I've been living at Gibbons Highland Park. Oh, nice to see you here. I'm Catherine Green Grimes. The Grimes is silent. My other significant father is off at a Master Naturalist Conference, but this is my second visit here, and I'm a co-founding member of the Lord Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We went to my very first GA, even though I was raised UU, um, this past year. I don't think I've ever been so bored in my life. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
Stop him to you. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, great. Well, we're really glad to have you all here. Um, announcements about the happenings in our congregation and community at large should be submitted for posting in our weekly, weekly newsletter, The Current, which comes out every Thursday via email. Current is sent to all members, friends, and those who have expressed an interest in our congregation and have shared their contact information with us, as in those white cards. Um, if you have announcements that you would like posted in the current, please send those to our office administrative assistants by noon on Thursdays, uh, Tuesdays. Um, you can find his email address on the website. And announcements may also be posted on the bulletin board in the foyer. Um, it's also our practice to acknowledge that the land where we are now gathered has not always been ours to call home. And for those of us who went to the uh, Beyond Land Acknowledgement Conference yesterday at, at UMC, it still isn't ours to call home, but it was a really interesting program. So thank you, ladies, who put that together. It was awesome. Um, do you see us yeah. <laughs> Do you see SV acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the ancestral home of the Cherokee and of other indigenous people. The Cherokee, through stewardship, understanding, and conservation, survived and thrived in this land. We acknowledge their enduring connection to their homeland. And now we will. speakers for every Sunday that Michael is not here. So if any of you are interested in being on that committee, we would love to have you. You could see Andy about it, or Harry, or Roberta, Lee, or me, if you are interested. It's a fun committee, but we're small and we need to grow. May our time here together renew our hope May the stories we share refresh our courage. May the songs we sing lift our spirits. May the words we speak invigorate us. May the touch of hands, the sound of laughter, the sight of faces new and familiar restore us in faith. Thank you, Lee. You may imagine that when we saw the title of Roger's talk, we started thinking about, we have to have music to go with that. And Sue and I had a hard time, because there's not much in our handbook about Christian nationalism. <laughs> <laughs> However, our first song seems to fit, and we sing it a lot. I think it's everybody's favorite anyway, almost everybody. Um, hymn number 159, please rise if you are willing and able to do so. <laughs>
Natalie, my husband and I, and I don't know if she's here, Helen Bell, are taking a class on Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. It's through the McCoy Center and it's taught at Gibbons Highland Farms. And we've received many, many handouts and readings, so I thought I'd share <coughs> some elements of religious nationalism that we received in that class. America is the promised land, the city on the hill, the light of the world, and sacred soil. One nation under God, allegiance to the authority, rule of a particular sectarian deity, adding to and emphasized over the original inclusive secular version, which was one nation indivisible. In God we trust. One narrow belief in one specific God, which replaces e pluribus unum. Deep suspicion or hostility toward the separation of church and state. Leaders and enforcers are primarily powerful, white, male, conservative Christians. <laughs> our joys and sorrows are a part of our service that many people look forward to. They're often deeply felt, but sometimes we don't speak them out loud. Your chance to do so is now. Please keep them brief. And please tell us your name when you do it. Too. My name is Mary Soyanova, and I would like to toot Shelley Frome's horn. <laughs> he has won a gold award for his writing in an international writing contest, <clears throat> and if you talk to him after the service, he'll tell you more about it. <laughs> My name is Deb Bingle, and I would just like to echo the thanks to the folks who put on the conference yesterday. It was a great event, and I would just add my feeling that we need to work on our land acknowledgement statement. Um, but that's not why I'm here. Um, on Tuesday, um, I lost uh, my favorite aunt. Um, she was my father's older sister. Listen to me. Yes, that's right. My father's older sister. And I often, um, I often joke that she was the only person I could think of that could be his older sister. Um, she was 97 when she passed. And she was the son, see? She was the daughter <laughs> of immigrants. Um, her father was a Polish coal miner, and her mother was from Romania. And she was one of those rare folks who continued to speak Polish when that wasn't happening. Um, and she was just, a, she was a nurse all of her adult life, and just did the work in her small community in West Virginia of connecting the generations and I loved her dearly. I didn't see her often because we lived in Florida and she was in West Virginia. But um, she was an amazing lady and I grieve her, but just honor her. Hi, my name is Larry Perlman. May we all live to be 97? No. No. <laughs> whatever age you choose. <laughs> so I have a joy uh, to share today, and that is that although uh, Michael Carter is not here at the pulpit today, he was on the radio this morning at 10 o'clock doing a sermon and a meditation, and will be on the radio. Um, it's The Bear, which is Black Mountain's radio station, 1350 AM, 96.1 FM, and he will be on next Sunday at 10 o'clock and the Sunday after that at 10 o'clock. They're recorded, so it's, he'll be here, but um, they're recorded sermons and meditations. So tune in and listen to them at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And tell your friends. Very good. <clears throat> Jeff and I will not be here next Sunday. 
We will be in Greensboro at our son's house with our daughter and her family celebrating Jeff's 80th birthday. My name is Joy. I do not have something to share with you that has any joy in it. I think a lot of you know that I haven't been able to drive and people, you know, have asked to help and this and that. I have memory issues and, um, you know, go from a love, laugh, driving your own car and all of that is gone. So um, related to that, someone contacted me, apparently connected to this group, not somebody I know or have seen. This was on the phone. And this person went on with I'm gonna pick you up every morning, I'm gonna take you where you need to go, and then later you'll tell me when I need to go home, and this and that, this is just fine, and on and on and on, and it was like, I said, you're an angel, oh my God, this is so help. And then at the end, that was the end. She went on to something else. Where am I? Is this me? Yeah. <laughs> right, my name is Linda Tatsapa. I have a, a joy and I have a concern and joy. Um, joy, for those who uh, know uh, Andy Gwynn, who comes occasionally and, and plays music for us and plays at Presbyterian Church a lot, um, he just had uh, knee, I guess it's knee replacement surgery, uh, went, I think, way better than expected. Um, I expect to see him jogging here next time, so it was a joy that that went well. Those can be tricky. Um, and just, uh, and um, related to today, I have, um, I have, Strong concerns I think we all share about our state and, and our country and a lot of things that don't need to be named, a lot of, a lot of serious concern um, and looking at where things are going in our state. I have a lot of hope and joy for the many, many people who are working with integrity and love for um, our communities to um, <clears throat> turn us back in a good way. So good morning, my name is Elizabeth Wallace and I was one of the people that helped yesterday with the conference on Beyond Land Acknowledgement. And one of the things that produced great joy in me was, you know, we had, we filled up, we had 80 people come and that was our quota, which was astonishing. But do you know that many of those 80 people were from this congregation? <laughs> And so I was chatting with Sue about that this morning, and she said, it felt like I was at, at one of the church meetings here. So that made, that fills me with so much joy and honor to be part of this congregation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my concern is that there's a man sitting in the front row with his hat on, which is kind of sacrilegious to me. <laughs> he has a hole in his head that he didn't want everybody to see. So that's why he has this hat. <laughs> also, if you light a candle, those who did not share their joys and concerns. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. It's temple, all space, it's shrine, the good heart, it's creed, all truth, 
its ritual works of love, its profession of faith, divine living, and joyful giving. teacher 50 some years ago and um, I drove by the church that he used to belong to every day on my way to school at least laughing because he knows the church too it's called New Hope Baptist Church in Charlotte and he has come so far from when he used to attend that church he is now a professor in the Department of Religious Studies at UNCA he earned his BA in Religious Studies from UNC Charlotte before competing, completing graduate degrees at Harvard Divinity School and the University of Virginia, receiving his PhD in American Religion from the latter in 1989. Prior to coming to UNC Asheville, he was chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Louisiana State University. He came here to create the Department of Re Religious Studies, where he served as department chair until 2023. As the first faculty member in Religious Studies, he developed and taught a number of new courses in religion and American history and science. He is also active in UNC Asheville's renowned Humanities Program. He has won numerous teaching awards, including recognition as the Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award in 2019-20 at UNC Asheville. He spent the summer of 2001 as a Fulbright Hayes Fellow in Morocco and Tunisia studying religious diversity. And from 2014 to 2018, he was the coordinator for the university's first year seminars. He put some emphasis on scholarly objectivity and critical thinking in his class discussions encouraging his students to think deeply about their own religious traditions as well as other religious traditions that they might not be very familiar with. 
It is a subject perfectly fit for the liberal arts as well. Payne once said, we are the quintet. <laughs> liberal arts degree, because you'll do a little bit of all as you work through our courses. You'll see religion from so many different angles and perspectives, and you'll have an opportunity then to reflect critically in many different ways. He has spoken here before and also spoke to us virtually during COVID, so we're very, very happy to have him again. And his high school history teacher, who is my dear friend, would be so proud of him. <laughs> Thank you, Diane, for that very gracious introduction. Yes. And I want to give this a try and see. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, All right. terrific. Um, again, thank you, Diane, and uh, let me say that. Um, your song choice and your reading were just perfect. Uh, in fact, uh, so perfect, I'm not sure that I have anything left to say this morning. Uh, I do appreciate, however, the tip jar that you left for me. <laughs> Writing in 1742 about the, quote, surprising work of God that had re recently shaken his congregation in western Massachusetts, the great Congregationalist minister and theologian Jonathan Edwards pondered whether the strange fervor might be the sign of a coming new age. Quote, it is not unlikely that this work of God's spirit, so extraordinary and wonderful is the dawning, or at least a prelude of that glorious work of God so often foretold in Scripture, <clears throat> which in the progress and issue of it shall renew the world of mankind. And 18th century, I apologize for the language. Um, while his clerical counterparts in Great Britain might scoff at the idea of any important religious work taking place in the American colonies, and least of all in the little frontier village of Northampton, Edward suggested that such a setting was not only possible, but probable. We cannot reasonably think otherwise, he wrote, than that the beginning of this great work of God must be near, and there are many things that make it probable that this work will begin in America. And if we may suppose that this glorious work of God shall begin in any part of America, I think we should consider the circumstances of the settlement of New England. It must needs appear that it's most likely of all the American colonies to be the place whence this work shall principally take its rise. While we may take issue with Edward's confidence of New England's role, his prediction that North America would be a site of, quote, the glorious work of God became a trope in the religious history of what became the United States. Why else had God hidden this land from European eyes for so long? Protestants noted the scant few decades that separated its discovery by Columbus from the beginning of the Reformation and suggested, therefore, that this was part of a divine plan to keep the continent pure from Roman Catholic influences. <laughs> Where else but in a wilderness could the Christian church be fully reformed and restored to its original purity? And if this was true of religion, why not political life as well? No bishops implied no kings either. And thus, from the beginning, religion and politics became the proverbial two sides of the same coin. In his revolutionary pamphlet, Common Sense, Thomas Paine, no relation so far as I know, urged his fellow colonists to understand that, quote, we have it in our power to make the world over again. Just as people should have the right to choose their political leaders, they should have the right to choose their religion without interference from the state. Conscience, whether informed by feeling or fervor or the individual's reason, would be the only arbiter in religious life. It was the beginning, as Thomas Jefferson said, of a lively experiment. 
When Diane invited me to come back and speak again this fall, I warned her that once again I was not a preacher, but a college professor. Um, although I did promise uh, not to give a boring lecture. Uh, so I hope that um, uh, I can meet uh, that uh, goal for those of you who found recent meetings uh, to be a little less than exciting. Um, although I guess all of that will be for you to decide. What I suggested we might do, however, is simply to explore for a few minutes this idea that many Americans believe that we, as a people, to borrow a phrase from the Blues Brothers, are on a mission from God. <laughs> it's a huge topic, one that requires much more time than I have here this morning, but my reason for suggesting it was because of the recent controversies over the rise of Christian nationalism and the melding over the past six or seven years of very conservative Christian theology to a specific political brand. Was the United States founded to be a Christian nation? Have we separated church and state in ways that the founders never intended? Is the United States in some sort of cultural and religious freefall? As I say, Big questions with no short and easy answers. So what I thought we would do this morning is to consider the ways in which these questions are approached by two historic streams of ideology. The sociologist Robert Bella, writing in the 1960s, labeled one of these ideological streams civil religion, borrowing the phrase from the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The other ideological stream will be that of religious or Christian nationalism and its various permutations throughout our history. I hope that by briefly contrasting these two perspectives, we can illuminate just a bit better the current situation in which we find ourselves. But, big question as I said, let's begin with one of the big questions that is easy enough to answer. Was the United States founded to be a Christian nation? No. <laughs> Reading the Constitution reveals no references to God or to Christ, and the only mention of religion in the body of the document is in Article 6, which forbids the imposition of any religious test for holding federal office. This does not mean, however, as some urge, that the writers of that document were irreligious, nor does it mean that they intended to create a secular state. Rather, as the later First Amendment clarified, the federal government was to be strictly neutral in religious affairs. While the Declaration of Independence, and unlike my students, know the difference between that and the Constitution, <laughs> While the Declaration had been filled with religious, if not overtly theological language, quote, the laws of nature and nature's God, or the protection of divine providence, the Constitution was conspicuously silent on the issue of a national deity. Rather, the deity invoked in the prayers at the Constitutional Convention was a curiously unaffiliated one. Indeed, many of the delegates at the convention would have agreed with Benjamin Franklin, who wrote in his autobiography that, quote, I never was without some religious principles. I never doubted, for, ex for instance, the existence of the deity, or that he made the world and governed it by his providence, that the most acceptable service of God was the doing of good to man, that our souls are immortal, and that all crime will be punished and virtue rewarded, either here or hereafter. These, he said, I esteemed the essentials of every religion, and being found in all of the religions we had in our country, I respected them all. In fact, there's a very funny story of uh, Franklin once going to hear the great evangelist George Whitfield preach. And he said he had determined that he was going to give, and I'll put the denominations in American money, uh, that he was going to give his quarter uh, during the offering. 
And he said as Whitfield began preaching, he decided that he was going to up that to a dollar. And by the time it ended, he said, I had emptied my purse into the collection plate. How many of you followed his example? <laughs> Similarly, Thomas Paine declared that I believe in one God and no more, and I hope for happiness beyond this life. I believe in the equality of man, and I believe that religious duties consist of doing justice, loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. In fact, most of the founders were convinced that it was precisely because they enshrined the individual conscience rather than the political state to religious affairs, and precisely because they kept such affairs separate from political affairs, the two principles that the First Amendment would shorten to the ideas of religious liberty and the separation of church and state. They were convinced that capital P providence their favorite synonym for this national deity, supported, therefore, their efforts. Lacking any national religion meant that the unity of the American people had to be symbolized and actualized through other methods. The late Baptist historian, and I will say Diane, I've come a long way from uh, that little Baptist church in Charlotte. Um, they wouldn't recognize me anymore. <laughs> and not just because of my white hair. <laughs> The late Baptist historian Edwin Gausted noted that both George Washington and Benjamin Franklin had become saintly figures to Americans upon their respective deaths, and no one who's seen the painting in the Capitol Dome could deny this. Do any of you know what's painted in the Dome of the United States Capitol? It's a painting called The Apotheosis of George Washington, apotheosis meaning his transfer into a deity, huh. is becoming a god. It's an amazing, amazing uh, painting. Similarly, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence came to be seen as virtually sacred documents, an older testament to which have been added New Testament texts, such as Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Indeed, these were the very things that Bella pointed to in molding his description of the American civil religion. Although it's not expressed in a church or a denomination, Bella argued that the existence of this civil religion has quietly been the glue that has held us together as a people. In fact, many of you sitting here today have a rather amazing religious, uh, civil religious artifact in your pockets. Um, anyone have a $1 bill? Mm -hmm. take, take it out. Have you ever looked at the back of a one dollar bill? Oh, yeah. Okay. My wife actually let me have one this morning. <laughs> As you look at the back of the bill, you'll see the great seal of the United States. Right? On the one hand, with the eagle flying with an olive branch grasp in one claw and 13 arrows grasp in the other. <laughs> this is the side that we're used to. And in the eagle's mouth, a ribbon with one of our original Latin mottos. Can anyone see what it is? E pluribus unum, right? Um, who are my Latin scholars? What does that mean? Okay. Out of many, one. Out of many, one. Right? It's a wonderful sentiment. Out of many come one. Did you know, though, that we had two other Latin mottos that you don't see uh, as often as e pluribus unum? Uh, on the reverse side of the Great Seal, you have this very strange image of a pyramid with an eye at the top, actually a Masonic symbol, and then around it at the bottom, nose. Or, and, and I apologize in advance for my Latin pronunciation. Uh, Nous ordo seclorum. Nous ordo seclorum. A new world order. <laughs> Above that, then, the words anuit queptus. Anuit queptus, which in the wonderful brevity of Latin means something along the lines of he 
He who? Well, the eye on the pyramid. <laughs> he has favored our endeavors. He has favored our endeavors. Note that the in God we trust was not added as a motto until 1956, but even then it was meant to be a general religious statement rather than an overtly Christian proclamation. As President Dwight Eisenhower said when he signaled his support to adding the phrase under God to the Pledge of Allegiance, America makes no sense unless it is founded on a deeply felt religious faith. And I don't care what it is. <laughs> of course, civil religion has not always been so inclusive. It could be and often was invoked to support various political and social policies. It joined in the rhetoric of manifest destiny and the conquest and dispossession of native peoples from their lands as the nation expanded westward. It promised much but gave little to women or enslaved Africans or immigrants. It's been used to justify wars from Cuba to Europe, where remember we went in 1918 to make the world safe for democracy, as well as in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It was not a form of Protestantism, yet it encouraged the fear and hatred of Catholics up to and beyond the election of John F. Kennedy as president. It was not specifically Christian, but it permitted anti-Semitism. In short, it is spelled often among those whom Abraham Lincoln called God's almost chosen people. <laughs> but in its principle of religious liberty and its erection of a wall between church and state, it continues to call forth the better angel, angels of our nature, again, Lincoln's turn of phrase, and speaks still with a voice of hope and optimism. Some scholars have detected the roots of religious nationalism in our civil religion, and they're undoubtedly right. But where civil religion speaks with a voice of hopefulness, religious nationalism speaks with a voice of darkness and apocalypse. Where civil religion continues to expand and to embrace diversity, religious nationalism retreats into tribal, tribalism. In civil religion, the national deity is an abstraction, the eye on the back of the pyramid who has favored our endeavors. In religious nationalism, the deity is a fearsome power who has found us wanting and deficient. A people who have failed, or at least who stand on the precipice of moral and cultural failure. The Christian nationalism that we see today is only the latest manifestation of this theme in the religious history of the United States. According to many scholars, the ideology of Christian nationalism, like Edward's own optimism about the work of God in America, reaches back to a time before there was a United States. One of its roots can be found in Governor John Winthrop's famous speech as the Puritan um, colonists uh, debarked from uh, the ship Arbella. Winthrop delivered a speech um, uh, as they were set to disembark for their new home in Massachusetts Bay. The God of Winthrop's speech is not quite the inscrutable deity that we might expect from those who profess to be Calvinists. In fact, Winthrop and the Puritans had developed a concept of God that was a bit of a departure from the utterly sovereign God of John Calvin. Whereas Calvin's God could elect some to salvation and condemn others to eternal damnation for re reasons that were totally his own, the God of the Puritans had become a deity who was more comprehensible, more predictable. The Puritan God was a maker of covenants agreements between himself and humanity that, and this is Winthrop's term, condescendingly restricted his activities. It was this God, Winthrop argued, that it extended just such a, a covenant to the New England colonists, and all they needed to do was to fulfill their part of the covenant. 
They would then receive the blessings of God. They would become, quote, a city on a hill and enjoy, quote, the praise and glory of all succeeding plantations. Fulfillment of the covenant responsibilities would indeed make New England a location for the wonderful work of God on which the entire world would uh, ask, Lord, make us like New England. <laughs> <laughs> the inherent danger with this idea of God in covenant with a society is that such a God all too readily becomes a tribal God. Tribal gods do certain things very well. They establish precise boundaries around their chosen people and protect the tribe from external assaults. They're very handy gods to have when you wish to divide the world into us and them, or even self and other. They're gods who prefer to rule by codes, strict precepts that define right and wrong, and they impose severe penalty for breaches in conduct. Tribal gods thus counteract the questions that might be raised concerning the problem of evil. Evil can be explained simply and easily as the punishment meted out by an offended deity. When children born of the Puritans rebelled against the strictures of their parents' religion, when the British government revoked their charter and King Philip led his warriors against some of the uh, outposts of New England, and especially when Satan himself assaulted the colony with a plague of witches, in 1692, New Englanders knew that it was because they had failed their God by sleeping in church, <laughs> using profanity, and most pernicious of all, allowing heretics such as Baptists and Quakers to infect the colony. <laughs> the Puritan tribal God continues to haunt our collective imagination. When Ronald Reagan spoke of the United States as being a shining city on a hill, he was giving expression to Winthrop's idea that the United States was somehow God's chosen nation and we are his chosen people. More insidiously, the concept of the tribal deity reappears whenever someone like Jerry Falwell blames the attacks of September the 11th on pornographers and homosexuals or virtually any time Pat Robertson spoke about current events. <laughs> In some ways, the God of American civil religion looks very similar to this tribal God of the covenant. Again, he has favored our endeavors, suggests that the God of civil religion retains a vested interest in exactly how the American experiment will turn out. Novus ordo seclorum, a new world order sounds vaguely similar to Winthrop's city on a hill. But if the God of civil religion seems interested in bringing unity out of diversity, e pluribus unum, rather than establishing boundaries between the chosen people and those outside, he or she or they is less likely to govern by sacrosanct commandments and more likely to trust the ability of human beings to reason together and establish laws based upon justice and equity. In conclusion, one does not have to study American religious history very long before realizing that the theme of national destiny has long been caught up in a swirl of religious and political ideals. We've seen periods of religious nationalism before. We will no doubt see them again. We've enjoyed periods of the best that civil religion has to offer. And we've often been, as we are now, at a crossroad where these two ideologies both intersect and diverge with one another. Thus it has been, and thus it is, for God's almost chosen people. Thank you very much. I did a very bad thing. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, our last hymn, we only have two, but our last hymn is <coughs> Our World is One World, number 134, Stand with Your Living of the American civil religion. And while we're usually aware of some of his words in the Gettysburg Address, I find him uh, most expressive in his second inaugural address, delivered just after the end of the war and just prior to his own assassination. Neither party expected for the war of the magnitude or duration which it has already attained, Neither anticipated the cause of conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and as a result, and a, and as a, and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. And each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. Neither of them has been answered fully. Well, 